Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I just want to get your name on tape first and last and the correct spelling so we have that. So if you could give me that. Okay, Robert A. Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R. Great. And do you, do you go by Bob or you go by Robert? Uh, it depends on whether you're going to hang me or not. <laughs> no, I, I, well, I mean, I, I go by Bob with all my friends. And, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, now, you... Uh, you had, uh, see, now you were in the Navy, correct? No, Army. Army, that's right, okay. The United States Army. And you had gotten into uh, the service at what time? In, in 41, August, well, I, I went down to the recruiting office and said I will uh, in, around August of 41. How, how come you decided to join the Army? Well, um, I, I was work, I'd worked in the bank for two, three years. Uh, there were a lot of World War One veterans in, at the bank that I got to know, and including uh, um, an attorney who'd uh, been in the artillery, and um, he was—I guess he was one that had the, in, the influence to for me to join the artillery. And uh, my dad was a veteran. No, he was. Um, uh, well, I, I don't know what he was called. He. he uh, uh, was drafted and uh, flunked the draft physical. He had a, uh, I forget exactly what they call it, but it was something, uh, some offshoot of rheumatic fever or something like that. And uh, so um, they discharged him from the draft and they had, I suppose, what was called in World War II, uh, um, oh, it was a, the term I can't remember the, the name of, but it was uh, like four F or four, well, yeah, it was similar to four F, except that uh, uh, it, they had jobs for people with physical ailments, and uh, so he was uh, in um, aircraft production. They made wooden airplanes over in the Detroit area and whatnot. Oh, really? Uh, and, huh. uh, yeah, most most of the. Uh, uh, small planes were uh, were made of wood, and uh, so anyway, he was uh, he did that for a year or something like that. It wasn't in very long because uh, the war was over, you know, in a hurry. So I had uh, that influence uh, of my dad be, having served and and um, volunteered and so on and so forth and uh, how were you just a kid when yeah. you when oh i wasn't born he wasn't married no i mean when you when you enlisted when you got in the service were oh, you just a young uh, whippersnapper well i was uh i was i think i just passed 21 i was around 2021 20, oh you were an old man yeah right compared yeah. to the yeah. kids that'd be coming in behind you there well yeah they they uh um i don't know what the age limits were on, on the draft but uh I think it was 21 to begin with. I'm not positive, but, and uh, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> between that and, uh, and well, there all kinds of influences that got me into this channel, you might say. I, I uh, played uh, trombone in a town band out in Hopkins, and, and uh, the band director, leader, was uh, a veteran of uh, uh, World. War, not well, I don't know. But he was over in Hawaii. Uh, after World War One, uh, did a hitch, and um, uh, so he was influencing the, the music from that standpoint. We had a few uh, uh, typically Hawaiian stuff uh, um, that we played, including marchers and Hawaiian patrol and one thing. So um, just that all came together, and, and uh, I. Intended to get into the army, uh, uh, and uh, all those things influenced what I how I got at it. Where where did you do your boot camp at? Uh, uh, Schofield Barracks, in in Hawaii. Oh really? So yeah. you yeah. headed right over to Hawaii? Yeah. Not knowing what was coming and yeah right yeah yeah I uh, in fact some of the, I got some pictures there of the activities on the transport on the way over, and. Uh, some scenery shots on you know on our first <laughs> uh, trip, we we landed. Um, I don't remember what time of day, but uh, 
I, I think it, it rained, and I say rained, I, I'm not sure what terminology should be used, but about five or six times between the time we got off the ship down in the harbor and the time we got on the dinghy uh, to take us up to Schofield Barracks. <laughs> And you, you dry, you know, it rained, and, and you dry off before it had a chance to really uh, let it soak in. And uh, they, uh, uh, this this dinky railroad, it was a little railroad that had some cars that would hold uh, passengers, you know. But uh, this it was normally used to haul, I suppose. Uh, uh, cane workers or pineapple workers around the, the various spots on the island where they did their work, and uh, and on the way up, I, I, I uh, every time we go past the uh, barracks compound, uh, <clears throat> all the guys, the uh, fellows that had been there for a while, all came out and, and gave us a hee haw, you know, uh, uh, the. Uh, General Taunt was uh, 23 and a butt, and what that was was 23 months, and you, you served for 24 months and went back, 23 months service and, and the butt end of a of a 24th month, <laughs> and uh, didn't know what that was exactly at the time, but I mean we found out later, and uh, all recruits were. Greeted with that. Now, is is Schofield? It's in Honolulu, right on the beach. Is that where? Schofield? Oh no, no. Schofield's up in the central plateau. So it's inland. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what was Hawaii was a lot different then than it is now. I mean, it was just a oh. tropical island, basically. Well, yeah. But they they uh, uh, they had there's still a lot of uh, tourist business, not to the extent there is now because. Uh, they, during the war, <laughs> brought Hawaii, people started knowing where Hawaii was and where Pearl Harbor was and all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, kind, and, of, kind of put Pearl Harbor on the map. There. Yeah, right. Huh. And uh, I know there was, uh, people suffered for not knowing what was going on. There was a, uh, what the heck is his name? There's a comedian from, I don't know if he was on Broadway or from up on the Poconos, but, um, he did a stand-up deal, and, he, and he, something to the effect of what, the, what was Pearl Harbor doing there anyway? And that kind of got people riled up. And uh, there was another uh, entertainer that made some remark. I think he got, I think he jazzed up the Star Spangled Banner or something. I don't know if you remember that. Or, uh -uh. I can't remember exactly who it was now, whether it was Duke Ellington or something, but he got sort of banished to the sidelines for quite a while. Huh. And, um, and of course, uh, I didn't come from the Midwest. I didn't know much about what was going on in Broadway, but we did have guys from uh, the Bronx and whatnot that uh, knew all these people by <laughs> their first name. And uh, they brought it up. But, uh, we <clears throat> there was there was a, a fair amount of. People making that kind of mistake, you know, in the first few days of the war, first few weeks of the war, and they, they learned eventually that uh, some things you didn't mess with. Now you can get away with, you know, jazz up the you know, you know, national anthem all you want, and nobody pays too much attention to it. You know? It's a it's a different world now, isn't it? Yeah, then? yeah. What? So, so how long had you been in boot before, or how long had you been in the service before Pearl Harbor happened? Uh, just enough to get through boot camp. Matter of fact, uh, our boot camp graduated on Saturday the 6th and uh, got an overnight pass that night for Honolulu. Uh, everybody on in, in the island, I think, was down there and uh, uh, we couldn't, a uh, buddy of mine and I <clears throat> went our own way, so to speak. I, uh, we couldn't get a a spot at the Army Navy wire or any place to stay over, so we just went back that night. Got back around, you know, 10, 11, something like that, midnight. And uh, how far is uh, Sheffield from um, from Pearl Harbor? Schofield? Uh, I don't know offhand, 20 miles maybe. So you're a good distance. 
Oh yeah, we were we were, um, uh, and, and of course we were up. I don't know what the elevation. I I should get a map, I suppose, and, and uh, get some facts uh, uh, rather than, than guessing too wildly. But um, uh, the the island is made up of, of basically two mountain ranges, the uh, uh, Kulaus and the Waianae, and they run on the outer east and west coast and, and run up basically up the uh, uh, spine of the mountain. And then in between is this flat area. Uh, probably should, I uh, should have looked up an atlas and got an idea of what the elevation is, but it's, uh, it's fairly flat up on that part of the island. That's where the uh, Schofield Barracks was and where Wheeler Field, Wheeler Field was the fighter base. And, um, and then they had uh, uh, other bases uh, and spotted around the perimeter. Hickam Field was the one that got right next to Pearl Harbor, and that got the most of, most of the damage. And um, and Wheeler got shot up pretty badly too. So you um, you, you got up. Uh, uh, you'd been on a little R and R. You graduated uh, from boot and, and had a little R and R. Had to get back to the camp because you couldn't get. Uh, Housing in in Honolulu. Yeah. What what happened on the day of, of Pearl Harbor? What was that like? Well, uh, it was uh, in, in a way, so you could say it was just uh, massive confusion. But um, uh, the, the fellows in, in my barracks were probably twenty, thirty. I don't know. How, we never did get a count because they, by the time we got everybody lined up uh, a couple hours later, well, we had pretty well sorted things out. But um, uh, the, uh, the mess hall is open on Sundays as well as every other day, and uh, uh, they have what they call line show on, on Sundays, and uh, which was uh, you go through the line if they have hotcakes while you order your how many hotcakes you want and so on, and if they had eggs, they you know, sunny side up or however you wanted them, and um, uh, and you know full full menu, but that, that must be right. And uh, so <clears throat> we were, um, I don't, uh, somebody came out in the, from the latrine out in the squad room and, and said something's going on and go on take a look and we went, and just these little fingers were in the back end of the barracks and, and uh, you could look down and see all this black smoke down at Wheeler Field. And um, probably, I don't know, maybe five, miles away, maybe a little more. And uh, <clears throat> so we, you know, looked out the window and there it was and wondering what was going on. Somebody said, what's the Air, air Corps? I got to make sure I don't <laughs> call it the wrong thing because it, it transformed itself from the Army Air Corps to the Air Force. But um, uh, we figured it was practice bombing with uh, these big, um, Practice bombs, which are about, well, they're pretty good size, uh, uh, but they just uh, had uh, black powder detonation. So we figured, well, it's, you know, uh, something's happening down there. Had no idea what it was. Could you see planes, or you just saw smoke? No, we didn't, we didn't see the planes, and um, of course it might have had to do with the con configuration of the building, but. Uh, uh, and if we could see planes, well, they were far enough away that we probably wouldn't have recognized them as anything other than what they were. But uh, um, and later on, uh, the, the planes started going back to the, uh, the fleet, which is a couple hundred miles north of Oahu. And uh, then we see these red meatball things on, on the side of the plane. And, um, Planes were uh, mostly uh, a, I wouldn't say an olive drab, but they were a gray, green, greenish gray color with a red meatball. And um, at first we, uh, we saw them you know, overhead and, and heading north. And uh, by then things were beginning to take shape. Uh, and then uh, a couple of planes, uh, the way our barracks were configured, there was, normally it was in a square, 
and um, with a big drill field and, and uh, uh, in, the, in the center. But we were brand new barracks and we had only two of the uh, barracks were completed, ours and, and the other one's headquarters. And uh, the third uh, side of the quadrangle was under construction. And, um, and the fourth side, I don't think it ever got built. I've been, I was back there in 86 and uh, they never built the fourth still, side. Still not done. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know whether they gave up on it or, or you know, what they did. But um, anyway, it, uh, uh, this plane came over kind of low and he went around and came back and uh, gave us a little uh, strafing. And uh, uh, that's when... Well, I got a, the guy right in front of me, and just already to go into the chow line, got a little nick on his leg, and uh, he looked around and, and uh, picked up the slug. It was a, uh, it was I think about 25 caliber, not exactly because it's, it's a metric system, but uh, just a slightly larger than a uh, 22 caliber bullet, and um, he uh, pulled up his pant leg and he had a little nick there, just barely bleeding. <laughs> But uh, and he, he got his, he said, "I'm going to go get my breakfast," <laughs> and, uh, and I was right behind him, so I got I got in and got fed too. And, and uh, there was nothing. See, artillery in those days uh, didn't have rifles. Uh, we carried pistols primarily, and uh, not for long, but it was uh, the beginning. And uh, uh, I was handed a BAR, uh, and we used those for anti-aircraft, you know, people strafing of the battery. And uh, so I was sitting out there, or standing out there behind a telephone post, was looking around you know, uh, <laughs> with this BAR, <laughs> and uh, I never got a chance to fire it. I, uh, there was one plane that I could have, but I didn't get it recognized soon enough. And uh, so when it when it came over and and uh, the guy in front of you got nicked, mm -hmm. everybody. Still not really realizing what's going on because it sounds like you yeah. guys are waiting to go eat. Yeah, well, you're, that's where we were, and there was actually uh, the uh, the officers and most of the first three graders lived off post anyway, and uh, uh, there was uh, the BARs and and well, I guess I don't know what what was uh, going on with all the weapons, but uh, uh, there was they when they. Gave me my BAR. I had some ammunition to go with it, and uh, so I was ready to go, but <laughs> didn't get an opportunity to to uh, fire at anything. So when did when did it really sink in that that uh, my goodness we had been attacked by the Japanese? And well, a lot, uh, I mean, I'm sure that anybody that really saw the insignia probably knew it was Japanese, although uh, it wasn't as the the blazing sun, you know, the the white flag with all the rays on it. I'm not sure which flag that is, whether that's their battle flag or what it is. But the the insignia on the airplanes was something else. It was generally uh, something that was handled by convention. That uh, we had the old uh, star with a red, white, and blue circle, you know, and um, eventually they changed that to that thing with the bar on it, you know. Went to World War Two with that, but uh, originally it was our our old World War One thing, <laughs> and uh, so uh, by by the time we got into you know, chowing down, you know, you know, those that decided they were going to do that, um, things were settling down to the point where we knew there was nothing we could do till somebody showed up to unlock the the uh, ammunition locker and, and uh, that sort of thing. And so we <laughs> had nothing better to do than eat breakfast, which was really uh, a soldier always watches watch <laughs> what's going on and only gets a chance to eat while he does. And, uh, so um, later on, then we uh, uh, orders started coming down from up as far as you could go. And uh, they sent two trucks of, uh, out to the uh, magazine to start loading up ammo and getting it out to our field. We all had field positions where we were supposed to go and guard this or guard that when, when something like this happened. And um, I was in uh, Battery D, which uh, 
<coughs> had just been reorganized. Well, the whole setup had been re reorganized in that fall. Um, they had the old, what they call a square division, which uh, basically was built around four regiments of infantry and, and the other stuff. And um, the, uh, the new triangular division, which uh, pretty well went through World War II with the triangular division, uh, had uh, three regiments. And, uh, and they broke up the artillery from regimental size to battalion size. And so our uh, 11th Field Artillery Regiment was broken up into the 11th Battalion and the 89th Battalion, which is a, a new uh, idea. And um, anyway, we, they sent us out to start loading ammo, and, and somebody was delivering the requisitions for the ammo out there, and we got told you do this and do that and whatnot. And um, they... Uh, since we didn't have, oh, uh, <laughs> I forget all kinds of stuff there, but um, uh, our 75-millimeter uh, anti-tank howitzers, which were set up to handle anti-tank work, um, were down in ordnance getting fitted with uh, battle sites. And um, they, they uh, sent us out. We had, we had plenty of weapons. Uh, because this breakdown from the four, uh, <coughs> uh, square division to the triangular had left a lot of stuff, and, and we had, they had extra stuff over there anyway. Uh, uh, <coughs> they had uh, the um, 155 millimeter GPF, which is a French gu uh, gun or a rifle, and um, it, uh, GPF was the French name for the for the web. We had a lot of foreign stuff, English uh, 75 millimeters and French 75 millimeters, and we were getting the American 75 millimeter <laughs> our, our, uh, guns. And uh, so anyway, we were out there loading ammo all day long and until finally it got you know you couldn't have any lights on, so we had to quit when it got too dark to. See what we're doing, but uh, so prior to that, it sounds like that you guys weren't battle ready at all. I mean, you were. Well, we were we were ready in the sense that um, uh, we were ready, except we weren't ready for what happened. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good military. We were ready, but we weren't ready for what happened. <laughs> well, uh, the um, uh, basically. Uh, each outfit, each unit that you could call an outfit had a spe uh, job to do, had a place to go and a area to guard, whichever, and if it was infantry, why they were going to get down and, and uh, get them as they came out of the water, and artillery was to whatever the opportune moment was to uh, sink the landing, landing craft and whatnot. And um, but the the island was of course pretty well populated with farms and and uh, that sort of thing and there was the Schofield Barracks area was had a lot of uh, area where you could maneuver and 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 that sort of thing but uh, you had to <clears throat> uh, get into a civilian place and and. Uh, uh, take over defending whatever area you could defend from that spot. Uh, I don't. I can't remember exactly how long we were without our weapons, but I, I know we got them within a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, in, the, in the meantime, we'd been stationed up at a, a sugar camp up in the, um, which had temporary buildings. So you, you can well if. if, if Ever been around any um, part of the country that has transient labor? Uh, this was even worse. <laughs> huh. But, wow. but um, uh, well, it, uh, they have to kind of replace the buildings every few years because the termites eat them up right down to the ground. <laughs> and uh, uh, they have the, the buildings are all up on. Uh, 
on post off off the ground, so you, uh, and, uh, but um, anyway, we were out there that uh, December 7th up until quitting time, shall we say, and, and uh, um, I'd been uh, loading 155 millimeter ammunition uh, primarily. Um, and they're, the, the, uh, what they have, ever been around artillery at all? No. Oh, well, the, um, the uh, projectile is about this tall, and uh, 155 millimeter is about six inches, not quite. And um, uh, they're stacked on pallets uh, on the base. Uh, the, the, the powder is separate. And um, and the uh, where you put the fuse it had an eye bolt, uh, and you picked that up with a cargo hook, which is a, a wooden thing that, that you grab and, and stick the, the hook in between your fingers and, and lift these things up and take them to the truck. Well, the cargo hooks were hard to come by, <laughs> and the alternative was to stick two fingers into this eye bolt and carry them like that. And uh, um, one thing you try not to do, which I didn't uh, learn soon enough, <laughs> was don't give up your cargo hook when you have to go to John or something like that. And, uh, or even, uh, even eat. I can't remember what we did about chow. I think they, I'm not even sure if we got any chow. But um, um, I think we did, I, I don't recall. It didn't make any difference. We were too damn hungry and too, too tired or anything else. But at, I remember... At, at this point, was it really starting to sink in, like, oh my goodness, oh, we're oh, at yeah. war? Yeah, yeah. Except that, you know, uh, well, we weren't, weren't sure if they were going to come back or not. There was rumors that they would go back and reload and uh, and uh, come back. To, to, but they, I guess they were pretty well satisfied with the job they did. And um, I, I suppose, you know, they they planned on a certain amount of surprise, and since they had shot their wad on the surprise, well, that was about it, you know. And um, there were rumors of, and there were planes, our planes flying over, too. And they, they uh, finally grounded them because they're um, causing too much disruption of, of hard work, you know. You, you, every time a plane came over, everybody would either head for the uh, underground or something like that. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, so you... Yeah. You know. Well, they, they had, they finally, uh, I know, but... Uh, well, I, uh, they brought our crew back to the barracks, and uh, uh, the officer's wives were over putting sandwiches and, and food together for us, and uh, so we got a chance to run through the shower and, and uh, sit down and eat some uh, good sandwiches and, and that sort of stuff. And, uh, and the next day they uh, picked us up and brought us out to the battery position and, and we were up in the mountain someplace and, uh, I, uh, and we, we didn't, they didn't move, I don't think they moved much during the day because uh, uh, our bunch got brought up uh, in, after dark, and um, nobody had <clears throat> decided which were the best areas to put down your bedroll, but uh, a lot of them, including myself, got it, got it in a, a little wash out there, and, and uh, it, when it rains at night, I, I had to move again. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we had, we had, uh, we were out there with, with uh, 155s, howitzers, and uh, we had we were finding spots that were suitable for their use because uh, they weren't <laughs> set up for that. And uh, uh, oh, it was probably a week or so later when we got our 75s and we got our more or less permanent. And we had alternate spots too, uh, defense positions, but we had to get set up to. Uh, so we could uh, zero in, you know, where your targets identified and that sort of thing. And so you set up small encampments. Yeah, we we uh, 
we operated as, a, as a, what do you call it, Section uh, 1, WEP 175. And um, we were out on a uh, uh, farmer's, uh, well, I don't know how, how much of a farm it was, but he had a bunch of avocado trees. And, um, uh, and uh, other, that, excuse that sort, and uh, <laughs> the ordinance that fixed us up was a site made out of a um, hacksaw blade and mounted uh, just off, uh, normally you have a, a optical site, and uh, this is mounted just off, and, and every time we moved that piece, the hacksaw blade went kaflui, and we had to re <laughs> bore sight it again. And uh, so we'd, we'd move in and hit, go under a, a banana tree or something like that, you know, and it'd knock your sight off, and then you'd come in. And, uh, and bore sighting was a matter of putting crosshairs on the muzzle and, and uh, a thing with a little aperture in the, in the uh, uh, <coughs> bore in the, uh, in the uh, Breach and, and you had to that was that got you sighted and you had to sight your your hacksaw uh, uh, blade and, uh, and uh, offset for the you know, amount of offset and everything. So and, did you get a test fired a few times then to make sure that you had gotten uh, things back well, in, or you just had to hope that you had? You would had to hope because uh, uh, <laughs> we, you know you, you, there was no place you could fire that wouldn't be <laughs> normally occupied by civilians <laughs> and. Um, but we were going to give them mail if the guys in the wrong color uniform came in there. Had they, at this point, had you um, uh, seen any photos or anything from Pearl Harbor to know what really happened down there, or, or what was your knowledge of? Well, uh, we got uh, we got a sightseeing tour fairly once things settled down to the point where we knew that we they could uh, uh, give the guys a break. It was you know it was. Mainly because there was a certain a heck of a lot of curiosity about it, obviously, and um, they also need to give the guys a little break of from sitting around and wondering wondering about what's going to happen next, you know. And uh, how soon was I mean, how close to was that? Like within a week? Or oh yeah, I would say within a week. Yeah, I don't I don't recall. I mean. I, I have no idea of the time element in there. I was going to say, I would imagine at that yeah. point, time just goes. So what was that like when you went down there? What was, what did it? Well, there was still some uh, uh, smoke, I think, as I recall. It wasn't completely, you know, uh, pulled out stuff that uh, you, you get, to, you bomb a ship and, and you get fire started inside and uh, there's nothing you do once the, the hoses are gone, or you know your your pumps are no longer working. That sort of thing. You just have to hope that you can that it'll die out eventually. And uh, obviously, they were doing as much rescue work as they could, but uh, uh, there's you know just a certain amount of stuff you could do, and then from then on, it was bye bye. And uh, yeah, we drove. It took uh, portions of the battery down, and. and uh, uh, let them get a get a ride around Hick Hickam and uh, Pearl, and, and then click around the island too. There, were, see, there were um, in addition to uh, Hickam and, and uh, Wheeler Field, which is the uh, fighter base up on Schofield, uh, there was a Marine Corps base out in uh, I think it was out in Evan, and. Uh, uh, one over on the other side of the island, and then there, there were temporary spots that were not ready for to take planes, but they were being worked on right right away. And then, uh, of course, the um, infantry was out guarding beaches. They had certain spots to uh, to uh, watch and and so on. And they were spread pretty thin because you. you uh, uh, had had to uh, stay in one spot and, and have an alternate defense spot uh, if they came the other way. So was when you saw Pearl Harbor. I mean, my my only visions of Pearl Harbor was what I've seen from newsreels. Was yeah. it? Uh, did it leave you speechless, or or was it? Uh, by the time well, you got there, they, 
by the time we got there, it, it was, uh, uh, I'd say, smoldering rather than blazing. I mean, obviously. Uh, in fact, they, uh, you know, there's, there's always a possibility of, of uh, ammunition. Uh, I don't know how many ships had full load of ammunition or not. I'm not, not sure that they uh, all did, but uh, nevertheless, there was still a lot of ammo on uh, on the ships. I mean, they, and uh, they had to be a certain amount, of, a certain amount of care. But you have ships that are have pieces missing and well, this way and that way, or yeah, it, uh, Arizona, of course, was. Uh, uh, the big thing, and I, as I recall, that was still uh, smoldering, but uh, I can't recall exactly what shape it was in, but there are a lot of ships that were uh, tilted one way or the other, you know, and um, some of them had, had sunk to the bottom and had a little bit of superstructure showing and so on. Wow. And, uh, so what was the gen general atmosphere of the guys that you were serving with and stuff, were they pissed off or were they scared? Or? Well, uh, I don't know if, well, if I, I know one guy that got scared, yeah, but um, uh, you know, you were trained to do a job and and everything was uh, topsy-turvy and, and you weren't ready to do the job, but you Thought you were ready to do, but uh, uh, it was just you know it was part of the job, and changed circumstances. But things always change in the army, and uh, you're, you have to be uh, flexible to to cope with what's going on. And, see, we'd we'd had we'd been on alert for, uh, and I don't know that much about all the ins and outs of this alert, but. Um, Back in around Thanksgiving time, uh, two Japanese um, diplomats came over and stopped at Hawaii, and we put on a review for them. And I don't know what they, what in information they took back with them and that from being watching that review, but um, the artillery rides in their prime movers and towing their weapons. Of course, we didn't have any weapons to tow and battery D, but uh, and then your, your crew sits in the truck, you know, and you got these bench seats along each side, and uh, you sit there, and, and uh, when you uh, go by, well, you salute like this, you know, and uh, uh, I don't know what, for sure what was uh, what uh, happened there, but. Uh, we, all, we thought there was something funny about that, uh, having the, these diplomats uh, observe that. And I, I've heard various stories since then, but uh, I don't know for sure what, how much of it is true. But um, anyway, oh, Cause, yeah. Because that's interesting, because you hear, you hear some people say, oh, we were caught by surprise, and oh, yeah, we, we should. And then people said, oh, we should have known that, that it was going to happen. We really shouldn't have been caught by surprise. And all that. So that's interesting that there were diplomats over there so you did a full military review form, then you brought well, the troops yeah, out. Well, yeah, as far as I know, now I, I think I read s stories about that in history books and whatnot that doesn't bring it out quite that way. But I don't know that could have been, uh, you know, whitewashing something too. Uh, um, See, that's a big thing. We're we're kind of putting pieces together. History is an interesting thing because yeah. history is not a science. I've yeah. discovered, yeah. and they forget little details. Yeah. Well, that's true. We had, uh, uh, I know I've uh, I've read quite a bit of um, history about the Philippines, and there are several uh, units. I, when I say units, I mean put together units of guerrillas that uh, fought up in northern Luzon and uh, in other locations, and uh, uh, stayed out of uh, harm's way all during. It. When I say that, they uh, never got captured. You know, uh, during, during the whole war, and uh, were there when MacArthur came back. Wow. And, uh, now, what what was what were you trained to do? What was your specialty? Well, I was I was just got out of boot camp uh, and trained in artillery, and um, 
Uh, I was in uh, what we had our camp, our boot camp was a full battalion complement, and so we, we were assigned to a battery. I was assigned a D battery, which was the anti tank battery. Others were attached to battery A, B, and C, and, and uh, whatnot. And uh, and they had people who this was a sorting out process. Also, if you had any particular aptitude for certain things, and that could include uh, cooks and bakers, that it could include truck drivers, mechanics, that sort of thing, and and the run of the mill was artillerymen, and uh, which uh, familiarized, you, you got familiarized with not only the 75 millimeter, which is what we were using, going to use, but uh, also the 155, um, and uh, that was well, that was a, a, another French weapon. It was a Schneider, a Schneider Crusoe was the manufacturer of it in, from France, and uh, they were shipped over here after the World War One, and they were our main armament. Uh, and eventually, we got the American 155s, uh, and I don't know how how obsolete those are now. <laughs> but then they, uh, we had, I think we had some searchlights somewhere in the, uh, um, in one of the battalions, I don't know, not necessarily all of them. Um, and we had uh, some GPS, the so 155 long, long Tom, or, uh, yeah. Is, is boot camp everything that, that uh, we read about in, in history books? I mean, was it the marching and the... Oh, you get a, yeah, well, I, Number one, uh, you get guys in in all stages of uh, physical fitness, and uh, so you start off with uh, learning how to get from here to there without royally, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, so uh, you get blasted out of your sack in the morning and go through, uh, and we, we had to use our, the, the batteries, uh, the latrines, so we had to work our way around that and, and uh, we couldn't disrupt their operations, but uh, I think they got us up early and we went through the latrine early and and then went down through chow line breakfast and then uh, <clears throat> our formation and would march off to the drill field primarily, depending on the on what was on the schedule, weather dictated a certain amount of it because it, uh, uh, if you had had to uh, keep things dry, why they generally had the uh, instruction over in the squad tents, and uh, you'd, uh, you'd go in and, and in the morning when you get through the uh, oh well the first thing was in the calisthenics that that was uh, to get you blood circulating and so on and so forth, <laughs> but. Uh, it, you go into an indoor uh, session and whatnot, and maybe they'd have a, a 45 field stripped and a lot on the bunk, and they would uh, instruct you in, in how to put it back together again. You had to learn how to put it back together before you took it apart. And, uh, and they also had some pertinent instruction, too. Never point a weapon at a man unless you intend to kill him. Just like that. And that was the first thing you, you learned before you touched anything. And they, I mean, they, they made it serious, you know, just so you knew uh, what they meant. They didn't want anybody playing cowboy and Indian. And, um, and so that was, and then other weapons too, we, we learned the, the uh, 45 because that was the, the weapon of most people. Um, and then the BAR, which I ended up having for some reason or another, I don't know how, but <laughs> either it was handy or <laughs> whatnot, or thought I could carry one. They're, they're a little heavy. <laughs> Did they take you through hand-to-hand um, -hand training and all stuff uh, like that? Or? No. They, um, the, the infantry, I'm sure, uh, went through bayonet training. We didn't, because we didn't have any bayonets, you know, in the artillery. And, um, um, and I suppose 
they did a certain amount of hand to hand. I mean, bayonet training is is hand to hand at the end of a bayonet sort of monster. I mean, you you learn how to find the, the spot right, right where you want it, you know, and uh, you have various maneuvers that you you f f uh, fend off blows coming at you, and uh, and so on and. and uh, well, that, that and I, as I say, I, I don't know too much about what went on in infantry, except that later on, when, uh, we had to learn a little bit of, of that. Uh, uh, well, in, in uh, the Korean thing, uh, uh, we had uh, carbines, were a weapon now, and carbines, they eventually fitted them with bayonets, and they were a little bit short if you happened to be uh, taking on a Jap who had a a rifle about two feet taller than he was, with a three foot band. <laughs> it looked that way when it came at you. But, uh, and, uh, Did you take uh, uh, boot camp very, fairly seriously? I mean, because Pearl Harbor haven't happened yet, or was, were you just thinking, well, I'll just work my way through boot camp? And Well, it depends on, keep in mind, we're uh, regular army. And we joined because we wanted to serve, uh, and maybe we wanted to uh, serve in that way. Uh, you know, you, you could have your choice. You could go into uh, infantry, artillery, uh, signal corps, uh, engineers, combat engineers, uh, in addition to uh, Doing fortifications by combat engineers also were frequently the first one in the front lines, and because uh, they had to destroy the any fortification the enemy ha had put up, you know, and and, uh, and it, it, when <clears throat> when we got into uh, this radar situation, what they did was they I don't know how they did it, whether how they selected us. But uh, most of the fellows were, uh, seemed to have a high school education at least, had, had a certain amount of skill at certain things. They may, may have been radio, radio operators, uh, they may have been radio repairmen, um, and so on. And um, so the, <coughs> you would end up having a, a wide variety of skills in a, in a uh, uh, signal Corps outfit, including the, the basic uh, job of the Signal Corps in, in a division setup that would have been running the wire uh, or setting up uh, radio contact from um, upper upper echelons down to lower and so on. And um, you always had a, and of course artillery had to run wire too because we had to get contact between the forward uh, control uh, operation and, and the batteries where they connect the two ends of the of the weaponry. And uh, so we always had a, uh, what we call a culvert dog. It was a small terrier type dog that could pass through culverts. And so whenever you were running wire, why well, you preferably ran it under the through a culvert rather than overhead. Uh, any, any wire that anybody could see was fair game for, you know, cutting it and whatnot. So you'd so, tie it to the dog and... Yeah, I just got a harness and, and attack the dog and train the dog. You had to train him to go through a lot of uh, that sort of thing. Huh. Uh, he's not on a T-O-N-E, but <laughs> 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 he's there. But, uh, so did you, did you end up working radar? Or well, yeah, I, I ended up getting one of these guys that, uh, for whatever reason, uh, was uh, transferred to the, to the radar, and um, so we we started off up uh, up in this area, Koke area, where um, the barracks were just being finished. We didn't have water in yet. Uh, we, they, uh, we didn't have uh, fuel for the cook stoves for the <laughs> uh, mess hall, and uh, 
And as I recall, I didn't have uh, um, blackouts. Uh, the windows weren't set up for blackouts, but what they had was a, a uh, sort of an awning type thing that uh, uh, came out and, and had uh, air coming in from the bottom so you could get uh, circula air circulation in the building. And, um, and, and this is all made out of tire paper. And then you could, during the, uh, the uh, day, well, you could raise this thing up and stick a prop in there, and then you had a light, certain amount of light, you know, and whatnot. And, uh, and are you on a, a remote mountain somewhere? Is that Well, you're generally on the top of whatever is there. And uh, there are two, there's a higher mountain on, on Kauai. Uh, <clears throat> Wailde Ali is, uh, is the wettest spot on Earth. And it, it, it was, it, I, don't, I think it's been superseded by something else, but that winter, uh, 41, 42, they had 628 inches of rainfall on that tip of the mountain. And that's a lot of water. <laughs> <laughs> you had to be just wet. <laughs> well, yeah, that, uh, I don't know if, if how many of those pictures you saw, but uh, there was one of, of uh, me in a um, overcoat and I also had gas mask and a helmet and rifle and whatnot. But, um, when, when, our, when our bunch got assembled over to, at the uh, Fort Shafter, I think was the, where we were assembling to get ready to go to Callaway, uh, our company commander had us go through quartermaster, and we picked up uh, overcoats, we picked up rain gear, and we picked up, I think, I don't know if that came right away or later, but uh, we picked up uh, sweaters, Red Cross made sweaters for us, and we had OD pants, and uh, uh, I don't remember if we, I don't think we had long johns, but anyway, we were set up for cold weather, and you know, when, when we were on our way up uh, to the mountain on January 22nd, when we went there, went by this CCC camp, and the kids were out there having a bang up time pelting us with snowballs. They had four inches of snow that night. <laughs> and and uh, we, had, we had to eat with them because our mess hall wasn't hooked up yet. And uh, so on. And uh, of course we, there was nothing we could do except help out wherever we could on, on getting ourselves set up. The, uh, um, the uh, 298th Infantry uh, Regiment was guarding our, there was a na local National Guard outfits and uh, they were guarding the place. They'd, they'd been guarding it ever since the war broke out, I suppose. It was a big hush-hush deal, you know. And um, all these carpenters were running around with their toolboxes, handmade toolboxes carrying their big block planes of all of wood except the blade. And all these guys were Japanese. Car carpenters, uh, the Japs went under carpentry, ah. and and uh, um, we uh, nobody thought. I don't, I don't know. I suppose they vetted them, but uh, uh, <clears throat> it was just one of those things that they were they were the best carpenters around, and they could build buildings. So in which is kind of so in Hawaii, I assume they weren't interred like in. No, I don't know if any of them were inter interred and sent back or not. I don't think so, because uh, uh, I, I never learned to hate the Japs. I mean, we uh, we were up on the top of this mountain, guarded by well, they, they were the, the infantry. Two ninety eight wasn't necessarily Japanese. I don't know how many if there were any. Non-Japanese. I mean, there were any Japanese there not in their spirit, but they were a mixture of of uh, Hawaiians and, and Filipinos, I suppose, and stuff like that. But um, they uh, and oh, when we got organized and, and transportation up and down the mountain, uh, there was a uh, we we had a rather limited. Crews, we weren't up to strength by a long shot, but we did get people down on uh, to the beach or down on the main uh, on the bottom of the island, um, 
uh, on a regular basis to give him, you know, uh, a break and whatnot. And uh, so the, uh, the assembly point at the bottom of the hill, when we dropped off with people going on pass and picked them up in the evening, I was run by a Japanese uh, named Nita. And, uh, and then there was another town, uh, Hon uh, Hon uh, I mean, uh, Hanapepe, um, that had a lot of uh, Japanese stores and whatnot. I wouldn't allow them because it wasn't a big, <laughs> big enough town. But um, and uh, the, the uh, there was a taxi driver. I think it was the only taxi on the island <laughs> at the time. But uh, she was, it was driven by a red-headed, red-headed Japanese gal. And um, uh, and uh, the guy who ended up. I guess running the uh, uh, USO or whatever, if whatever passed for the USO, whatever was a Filipino by the name of Sunday Rientasso, and um, he was uh, he he brought up hula gals up to while well, they put on their shows down at the uh, CCC camp because that was available then, and um, so that's halfway. The, that's the CCC. CCC camp where the snowballs were. Yeah, yeah. So they had, so they put on some quote USO shows there for you. Is that yeah, they they put on. Uh, they were uh, allowed to go up that far, I guess, and and, uh, and we had uh, a chaplain, uh, Japanese Baptist minister, I guess he was. I don't know for sure. He's Japanese anyway, I know that, and he wasn't Catholic, but. Uh, um, and uh, they, they, they treated us like they, they must have felt that they finally had somebody there to take care of them in case something happened, you know. And uh, but uh, and um, there was a fellow by the name of Robinson, uh, yeah, I guess it was Robinson, Mr. Robinson, was he married into uh, a uh, family that owned the island of Niihau. I don't know if you've heard of that or not, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a little island off, off of uh, Hawaii. You can, it's visible from the, from Hawaii, I mean from Kauai. Um, and uh, he married into the family uh, that owned that island, among other things. And uh, uh, we got to know him uh, fairly well. He, well, he picked up a soldier every time he saw one. He, Took him where you wanted to go, you know, and uh, um, he uh, the the uh, natives on Niihau. It's the only place in the world that, that this little uh, shell is. Li well, I mean, the shell lives and dies, and uh, the people there they're little tiny things. Um, the people, the natives there on the island, uh, collect these shells and they. Uh, weave them into necklaces, lays, gel ah. lays, and uh, so if Mr. Uh, uh, Robinson uh, brought some along with him, and he, he didn't give them away, but he could buy one for twenty-five bucks, and I took mine back with my wife on our last trip over there and had it appraised five thousand. That's a good investment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when when you would go on R and R, did, did from your outpost, did you go down to the beach or what? Did you? No. Uh, there, well, there was nothing. There was nothing much happening at the beach except uh, uh, they had what we call a kiawi course. Uh, it's a um, uh, bush uh, type uh, thing that. that uh, Takes over beaches. I, I'm not sure if it's. A, I think it's probably the in the um, Lesium family, which is very prolific. Everything is, isn't something else is Lesium. Anyway, they used to have this Kiawi core that would down there and, and uh, cut the Kiawi bushes down, so you have uh, a line of sight out. To, you know, in case anybody come in, you wouldn't have to worry about them settling down on the Kiawi. But uh, uh, anyway, and uh, 
Oh, all the barbers were Japanese girls. Um, not necessarily all Japanese, but they're all girls. And um, they had, uh, oh, there was, there was a, an existing uh, gym and, and like a uh, uh, athletic club type thing that has gymnasium and so on and so forth. And that was, um, that was owned owned by uh, there's a lot of German immigrants over there or people German people of German extraction that settled there and uh, um, and I think I think it's predominantly Korean but I'm not sure about that either there, there's uh, uh, a lot of Koreans over there I know that and uh, so it sounds like uh, other than the military outpost that that really life as we know it on the island kind of went on somewhat normal. Well, uh, you you got two basic crops: um, sugar and and pineapple. And if you try to figure out who you're going to sell sugar and pineapple to, it's got to be somebody off yonder, and and uh, <laughs> the, the islanders aren't going to eat it all, and. Uh, um, they they grew other stuff. I mean, they, you've heard of Kona coffee; it's rather famous. And um, uh, the um, I keep forgetting the name of some of this stuff, but uh, um, little orange thing that uh, oh, uh, no, not papaya. Yeah. Oh, papaya. Uh, yeah. 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 It, there's papaya groves and. Uh, uh, they, they, there are certain things they don't do over there, and which we found out every so often. They don't grow potatoes. They grow yams, but uh, um, we had a, ran out of potatoes for about a month or so. And uh, you try to figure out, you know, uh, some all the things you can use potatoes for, including uh, hash browns for breakfast <laughs> and uh, whatnot. And uh, also they. Uh, well, they, they have cows. They, uh, there's certain restrictions on how much cows, you, how many cows you can have around. You know, you got it takes a lot of room to <laughs> to uh, house much cows. But um, and they used to feed the cows the uh, uh, mash from the sugar uh, mills. Um, it was uh, the stuff that you couldn't refine into sugar <laughs> and whatnot, and uh, that, uh, how, uh, um, well, pigs, yeah, they, you know. Oh, is that a while? Well, well how, uh, um, our radar at that time, the, what? the, 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 um, your, uh, tower that you built and everything like yeah. that, how advanced were we? Were we pretty primitive or? Well, uh, we, we were, um, we had gone one way and the British had gone another. And of course, um, this stuff was all super secret. Uh, and we learned what we had to learn to use this stuff. And, um, and then eventually they, they had some uh, movies, uh, training, training films, uh, that showed us what the British were doing. But I don't know how old that was and how obsolete that was either, because it could have been, uh, you know, uh, 1938 basis. But um, the <coughs> we had um, a rotating antenna, for one thing. Well, the British had a lot of antennas set up at, at on an intercept basis. Of, you know, to get two two echoes to coincide with each other, and that's a, a flight of plane. So ours ours was uh, uh, based on a, a rotating antenna, and um, that had some disadvantages in the sense that uh, uh, if you got a lot of business going on, and you sometimes had difficulty keeping track of everything, but uh, normally uh, you'd you'd pick up an echo or a blip, as they called it. Um, and uh, on you, as your antenna passed, so this would flare up on your screen, and um, 
So you'd go back and, and zero in on that and get the mileage. You, you read the mileage off the time element that it took to the echo to, to the uh, uh, blip to go out, out and back, and, uh, and then you you start tracking this. And uh, if it was coming straight in ahead of time, I began to get a little worried. And if it was going sideways, I had somebody else's problem eventually. And, and uh, uh, we had, um, at first, we, on our initial setup uh, on Kauai and other places right after the war broke out, we um, had uh, radio contact with, with Oahu, where they had the big filter center, which they filtered all these incoming uh, images and uh, let me hold that thought for just a second. I got to switch tapes here. You talk about the the moving antenna. Is it back and forth or all the way around? Well, it it's, it can go all the way around. Uh, you, it's it's a big thing. It's uh, oh, I don't know offhand. I uh, never measured one, but uh, but they're it's, it's good like, size. Yeah, it, we call it a bed spring antenna, but it was um, yeah maybe eight feet wide and. 12 feet high or something like that. Because wouldn't that also be a disadvantage with English? I mean, the fact that if I'm flying over to see this moving versus things just... Well, uh, you're... What, what uh, the main defense that got uh, a lot uh, more useful later, but uh, it's... Uh, as far as we knew, the Japanese didn't have radar. Although I believe they they had something now. But anyway, they also um, uh, we <coughs> we pick up an echo an echo on the fringe of our area, and it would immediate, immediately after two or three trips around. It only it only took. Uh, a minor amount of time to, to turn the antenna around one. You'd certain, certainly get a pathway coming in and uh, or going across or whatever. And uh, after a minimum amount of time, uh, somebody would send a fighter out to uh, check this guy out. And um, they, they weren't, uh, the Japanese as far as I know, didn't use radar, and they didn't know that we had it either uh, on December 7th. And um, uh, so it was, it was mostly a matter of catching these guys and their intention uh, early enough to send the uh, flight out to uh, intercept them and check them out further. They probably flew you know, way above and, and um, found out Number one, is it a friend, friend or foe? And uh, see, eventually they had, they had all this kind of fancy stuff that uh, went with the uh, radar system. Uh, I, I was on um, Saipan with a, a bunch of fellows from our battalion that uh, were uh, catch, catching up with the latest developments, which was a microwave early warning set that they had there in, in Saipan. And uh, so we, we were operating that uh, and learning all the jobs and so on and so forth. And um, the, there's, there's a lot of stuff that went on in between uh, 1942 and, and that time. But um, the, uh, we had a, a IFF, which is Identification Friend or Foe, and that set out a signal that uh, the aircraft had a transponder that would send it back and and identify itself as friend or foe. And uh, if it didn't get the right response, why then they sent fighters out to check it out. And so did you, um, is that something you saw on your screen? Uh, or is that No, it was something, uh, uh, it was something that uh, in, the, in the echo, it was coded in, in the echo. Um, I don't remember uh, too much about it. I remember we had we had a, a height finder, which was a, a, a sh parabolic shaped thingy that went up and back and forth like that, and it wasn't too good, but it was better than uh, a lot of things were. <laughs> and uh, uh, that you had you had an opportunity to catch this thing at a certain spot, and and the echo uh, 
uh, told you how far up it was. And, uh, and then uh, that was um, uh, the height finder and then the uh, horizontal antenna also rotated. But we had, at that time, we had all kinds of, of uh, screens that radar screens to pick up the various signals that came back. And um, it was, the end, you can't get a very good idea what it was like from those pictures that I, I don't know if you saw them or not. But I, I haven't yet, no. Yeah, I, I've got pictures that uh, this friend of mine, Gaylord Anderson, brought back. He was a, a warrant officer in the Signal Corps and was on uh, EWO with us. And uh, he also went to the University of Minnesota and came back and he recruited me to be first sergeant in the Minnesota National Guard Signal Corps, uh, Signal Company. And um, anyway, he, he brought back these pictures of this uh, monument that's up on the top of Ewell. And um, uh, I've got a, a couple of pictures of that one, a big one. But um, the stuff is still just stacked up there. They've got it up to the top of the mountain and they flattened out enough area to build a thing. And that's about all. They had, they had a one ray dome that uh, was erected in probably some kind of a, a minimum uh, detection system that was there just to uh, take up. And that was was that on uh, uh, Suribachi? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Suribachi. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Now was again now now so so you you didn't spend all your time on on Hawaii. You ended up. Oh yeah, yeah. I, 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 we ended up uh, uh, different spots. Um, the the, the uh, situation on Kauai changed over time too. They uh, originally we transmitted our uh, information to uh, Oahu, and they had one big filter center there that uh, uh, gathered in this data from sets from radar sets on other islands, and and also I suppose they did some from uh, ships to Navy Navy had radar, but. Uh, it probably wouldn't set up for stationary ship in Pearl Harbor, but they would have it. <coughs> but anyway, um, uh, I, I have no idea what, what the English ended up doing, but uh, their, their first sets were on this triangulation basis. They had sets spotted along the coastline uh, every so often, and, and uh, sets that they could cover the whole uh, coastline. and. Uh, the Germans, of course, said, well, they can go around. Yeah, they go around, but they haven't got any gas left when they get there. So, you know, it was the deterrent that's what it amounted to. <coughs> and, um, and the English uh, uh, had that, and, and they uh, very su successfully kept their aircraft in reserve to go up and do their job of getting the Germans in at the right time. And they made it so expensive for the Germans to send a flight of bombers over, that uh, they just finally had to give up, and that's, that's what won the Battle of Britain, was this uh, radar and, and the fact that they could uh, concentrate their forces and, and, and get the bombers before they got to England, and, and finally just made it to, to uh, the, the English lost a lot of stew, but you can build a fighter plane a lot quicker than you can build a bomber, and uh, you can get them over there in a hurry, too, so it was... Uh, Thing that came. So where did you, where did you go after, uh, other than Hawaii? Which other islands? Oh, you... uh, uh, um, well, we were on Oahu, which was uh, just a transitional period, and then um, uh, I went down this uh, uh, TD temporary duty group down in, in uh, Saipan to learn this new uh, radar that we hadn't seen before and how to, how to operate and so on and so forth. So that was training. Yeah. Well, it was, it was actually operational. We just we just filled in uh, the regular crews there and, and worked uh, worked daily uh, stints on on the way there. Because it sounds like a lot of the war was like that. That we had all this new technology that we put guys in that knew kind of how to use it, and we were kind of figuring it out as the war was going on. And well, yeah. I, you had to. Uh, I mean, obviously. Uh, uh, they, somebody didn't just dream us, put this stuff together and we'll call it a radar. Uh, they 
based on experience that we've had in the first couple of years of the war, where they, they uh, um, and you know, you don't develop this sort of thing overnight. I mean, there's a lot of uh, you look back at the history of armaments and whatnot, and, and uh, uh, it always amazed me. I remember hearing about the Grand Rifle before I enlisted, and uh, it sounded like you know the best thing since sliced bread. But uh, it was um, just a, a piece of armament on the way towards something better. And uh, the, uh, like for instance, the, the uh, caliber of the, uh, our rifles and the BAR well, 30 caliber and, and a certain amount of uh, hitting power. And um, then somebody uh, got the idea of the, of the carbine. The carbine used to be a, a 30 caliber we uh, weapon, but the carbine that was brought out late in the war was a, a much smaller uh, cartridge. And uh, you could get Fire, uh, you, could, you could fire a certain amount, a number of rounds uh, to, to where the point you didn't have to necessarily aim right at a guy. Um, huh. But uh, and now the, the uh, uh, weapons that, that uh, some of the, which they're using in, in uh, Vietnam can spit out a bunch of bullets. And uh, you, you, don't, you don't aim your fire anymore. <laughs> You just spray it out there and hope it's a. You know, it's um, the 45 caliber pistol was it was developed at a period of time when uh, European countries and the U.S. were all trying to find the uh, the ultimate weapon, and uh, they go back and forth between a 38 caliber or, and a 45 or. Uh, something even smaller than that. And uh, it, it boils down to how many bullets can you get out in a space where you can do some damage. And the uh, the deal on the 45 was that, uh, uh, this is maybe apocryphal, but I don't know, um, the, uh, the Moros, the natives down in the southern Philippines, uh, you couldn't stop them. They get going, and, uh, like the Japanese kamikaze. You know, uh, the only the only way you could get them would be to have something hit them that would knock them down. And if you could stop them, then you could get them. And uh, so the forty-five slug will, you know, literally, if you hit a guy in the right spot, why well, it'll it'll send him to his knees. And uh, whereas a you know a twenty-five caliber or thirty-two caliber might not do it. And uh, so that, uh, uh, do you watch any of this? Uh, the History Channel? History Channel? Uh, yeah, I, I've yeah. been trying to, especially now with this project, trying to get better educated. They've got yeah. some good good presentations. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, there's a lot of repetition. I mean, they uh, do them over again, you know, and, and, uh, reruns. Anyway, uh, that, um, uh, oh, I, I, was, I, think I, I mustn't forget. Got to tell you about Frenchie. <laughs> oh, uh, when I went to McDowell, um, uh, they assign you to a barracks and they tell you how to get there. And they tell you don't walk off the path because you'll end up with poison oak. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, I don't remember exactly how I how it happened, but I was sent down to barracks. G4 or whatever it was, and uh, I get down there, and uh, this is this is out in uh, settled out in, in the boonies, sort of, on, on Fort McDowell, and uh, a nice, pleasant place, and you know, September, uh, nice and cool there, and uh, I get down to barracks, and uh, there's one guy standing over uh, near the end of the barracks, real sharp-looking guy, and. Uh, He's got a garrison cap on us, the, the one with a bill on it, you know. Um, they, they call it something else now. But anyway, um, the uniform was tailored, and uh, which meant it fit him. And um, so uh, uh, I said hi, you know, and went on. And he had a real thick accent. 
and uh, but we got we, we were able to converse and whatnot, and just the two of us, and and uh, uh, found out that he was had been a um, in a security uh, detail at the uh, World's Fair, 39 World's Fair, and um, he'd had a heck of a problem uh, wanting to get back to France and fight the Germans. And uh, but uh, he, he was over here on a diplomatic visa, whatever the thing was, and they wouldn't draft him. And uh, I didn't find all this out at that session, but eventually uh, here he was. Uh, well, I guess I don't know how, when they shut down the World Fair, but he uh, had a little, little or nothing to do with at one point in time there, and. Um, there was a uh, Frenchman, he always called him the Frenchman, um, lived out on Long Island, and uh, he was on the local draft board. And so, and Frenchy got to pestering this guy, and finally he got himself uh, drafted. And here comes uh, the army, what can we do with this guy who speaks French? You know, <laughs> and uh, not, not much else. Not very good. <laughs> not very good English. You know, and uh, uh, he, there was another another uh, point too that should be noted. I guess the freshman had a beautiful daughter, <laughs> and uh, so Frenchy <laughs> began to spend more and more time <laughs> on Long Island at the Frenchman's place and whatnot, and finally this freshman got him drafted. He ended up with a three on his serial number. And so they decided, the army decided, well, by gosh, he can translate dots and dashes into A's and B's. And it don't matter whether they have any funny marks over the top of them or not, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> and uh, so they started to train him in, in uh, uh, Morse code and whatnot. And uh, how they got this, how they got to send him over to Hawaii, I don't know. Unless they figured get this guy out of our hair. <laughs> uh, it turned out that he'd, uh, he'd uh, been a uh, tank driver, and I guess in the French Army. Or uh, that's another thing too. His hometown is a place called Marsh, which is on the border. It means the border. Marsh is uh, one of those. Terms that you find all kinds of marchers out on, or marks, or this and that, out in the, in the boonies, <laughs> uh, which at one time, uh, in fact, where my family came from was on the marsh, and uh, the uh, Alamans uh, beat up on the Romans and sent them packing down. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, there's Frenchy, and he was going overseas, and um, I didn't learn all about the, the uh, uh, Morse code and that sort of stuff, but I just learned that he was going over to, obviously going over to Oahu because uh, that's where he was at Fort Meadow. And uh, so anyway, after uh, I got through boot camp and, and got uh, booted down to the radar um, and was assign, assigned to a, a radar, radar station, a new one out on, on the uh, uh, coast of Oahu. Um, and uh, the food after the war broke out started to get a little bit funny. Um, the, before the war, the uh, mess sergeants could borrow us go to the, uh, to the uh, uh, commissary, the, the, uh, uh, the quartermaster corps, uh, and uh, you know, go down and buy your groceries. You had, you had to uh, get I suppose you get the uh, mess officer of the battery uh, to approve the, the menu, men, main menu, but uh, most of them uh, just told the guy, you're doing very good, <laughs> stick with your uh, menu. And uh, so they uh, had to bring, now well, they started having to bring back what nobody ever wanted, including uh, beef hearts. And that, of course, was subject to uh, Different interpretations to what it was actually, but anyway, uh, it was 
very tough meat, but you know, a heart is, is a different texture than a, than a sirloin steak. Is. Anyway, uh, we had already, we were already in, in a semi-farming area. I don't know if, it's more like a suburban farming area, you know, might say. There were chickens around, for one thing. And uh, so we supplemented our beef heart menu with occasional chicken and whatnot. And uh, uh, we were we were actually billeted in a uh, in a uh, cottage, I guess you'd call it. It was on the shore. We were right on the on the water practically, and and the radar station was was a portable radar station. The portable and and fixed radar station are essentially the same, the same guts of it, except that the radar was in a van, and they and then the, the antenna was on a trailer that they pulled in and, and they raised it up and guided down and drew the van up and hooked up the, the uh, wires and so on and got it working good and, and uh, they also had had a, uh, a van with a, a diesel generator on it. Generates, you know, you have to have, have, to have power. <laughs> Self-contained. <laughs> wow. But, uh, anyway, that, uh, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, after we got established there, who should show up? With our mess truck, but Frenchy, they turned him into a mess sergeant, and uh, so I, you know, renewed my acquaintance. I, we had, didn't know each other as such, you know. I just uh, met him for ten minutes or so at Fort McDonald. But um, anyway, uh, uh, he did the best he could with what he had to get, you know. And uh, uh, by this time, they, they must have had a half a dozen or more radar stations around the island. Uh, um, Wahoo wasn't very good for putting one up on the top of the mountain because of these two ranges that were there, and you had to get up above that, and then you weren't up, you were blocked off by the range on the other side of the mountain. But anyway, uh, uh, that was Frenchy. And then uh, we went through some mess sergeant problems with uh, with our company up there on, on uh, Callaway. Um, and I've forgotten the guy's name, but eventually uh, we couldn't keep him in lemon extract, and uh, we um, had to get rid of him. And what we got was Frenchy. And my gosh, you know, we went through the rest, well, almost went through the rest of the war together. But um, we were in our, uh, had been transferred back to Oahu to uh, continue our training with this new equipment and whatnot. And um, we were there in uh, December 44 when the Battle of the Bulls started. And Frenchy's brother had been a uh, prisoner of war and had been released by the Germans some time ago. And here come the Germans heading straight for Marsh. And Frenchy was, I mean, he. He turned French right then and there. I mean, he was going to get back. We had so many different uh, alternatives to serving your time out there. Um, and one thing that had happened was they uh, figured these guys are going rock happy out here in the Pacific, and uh, we better give them some recreation and whatnot. <laughs> so they, I uh, deemed up this. Uh, um, It had a name for it again. I'm I'm getting too damn old for this business. <laughs> but um, oh, rotation, rotation. Uh, if you wanted to do it, you could get yourself transferred back to the mainland and uh, go through a rotation and get attached to uh, an outfit that was headed for Europe and uh, get a chance to uh, enjoy some of the uh, fine wines of France. And so on. Of course, Frenchy wasn't going to go back. He had enough French wine to last him for a while. <laughs> uh, he, he was going to go back and, and rescue his family from uh, advancing Germans. And he, he was just going crazy. He just couldn't wait to get, get on rotation. And um, so he, he finally made it. They didn't train him to tag along with some. Regiment to go back to in the combat. He, he, 
looked at his record and saw he had been in, in uh, security uh, work with the. I never did find out whether he was French or, or Belgian. Uh, we, we always called him French. It's like you know, uh, certain certain generic people uh, get called something whether it's right or wrong. And uh, he spoke French. Yeah. <laughs> I think he spoke French. I'm not sure, but <laughs> <laughs> they, they speak three languages: you know, French and, and uh, or uh, Flemish and, and uh, Walloon and something else. And, and uh, anyway, but uh, he made it back, and he got put into uh, the CIC, and uh, uh, or whatever, whatever. I'm not sure if that's the right name for it, but it was CIC in the Navy. But anyway, and uh, so. Here he was, uh, I don't know if he's chasing down uh, uh, people who were high on drugs or whatnot, but anyway, he was, he was doing his job and, and uh, so he ended up going into retirement not too many years ago, but he was still working, like, a, like on a uh, part-time basis, you might say. and. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, we exchanged Christmas cards uh, pretty much all through this period of time. And um, he'd, he'd always he'd had a sort of a hush hush address to his, uh, uh, I think he had his own personal APO. But anyway, whatever it was, it would uh, uh, change every so often. And then this one year, a couple of years ago, uh, his card was very, uh, handwriting was almost illegible. And I wondered if he didn't say too much that year, and, and uh, well, we never did say an awful lot, but um, I wondered, and there were some friends of mine from uh, the islands that uh, uh, were uh, corresponding with him also on a Christmas card basis, primarily. And, um, Third hand, I got information that this one gal was still in contact with Frenchie. This was after I'd received this card that I could hardly read. And uh, so I was, I'm still trying to find out about that. But uh, uh, <clears throat> in the meantime, I, uh, a couple of years ago, I got a card that came back with a post office stamp on it, APO closed, uh, whatever the extra term was. So I don't know, I assumed that maybe he'd had a stroke or something. And mm -hmm. I'm going to try to find out. I, I called this gal over in Hawaii the other night. I tried to find out if I could, you know, find out something to wrap up that story a little better. But uh, You'll have to have Doug work with you on the internet because it's amazing yeah. where you can start. Well, I what I did, I, I tried to... Um, uh, get her phone number and, and uh, call, and um, they had a very exasperating time with the operator over in Honolulu. <laughs> and um, I had her address, so I had her, uh, she lived there for 40 years at least, and um, uh, on her last Christmas card she for some reason or other, gave me the name. Well, I'd already had the names except when they were young. Uh, the names of all of her children and grandchildren. <laughs> and <coughs> Do you think? Uh, um, one last question, I guess. And looking ahead to to generations to come, because history is, a, as we've said, history isn't a science. Yeah. Uh, but do you think that there's a message? from World War II that should be left for the great-great-grandchildren that, that you'll never meet, that I'll never meet? That... Well, I thought about that a little. I, I, I'm sort of a history buff myself. I read a lot of history, uh, uh, not scholarly stuff, although I do occasionally get into it, but uh, like I've, um, I've read a couple of translations from the German about the Thirty Years' War, because my family started back then. and. Um, uh, in fact, the, I don't know how to describe it, the oldest forebear of mine was 
uh, born in, in a little town of Weiler, uh, sometime in the early 1600s. And um, I don't know when, but he died at age 79 in, in 1675, or whatever it was. It puts him right back there at that period. And I've got the birth records of several of his sons who were born around 1648, which is, again, right at the end of the Thirty Years' War. And um, this one history is <clears throat> uh, rather amazing in, in a sense that I never read anything quite like it. But when you look at the period, this, this writer of the history uh, sounds as if he must have been uh, of the nobility, I guess. Um, and, and he speaks very familiarly with other uh, people in the nobility that were prominent in the, in the war and that sort of thing. And then um, I've also read a, a history of, uh, what's his name, Gustav, uh, the, the Swede that came down and helped out, <laughs> helped himself to put everything in sight too. I think. Uh, and wars were so different in those days. Uh, and also there's some reference in a program I didn't watch recently about what went on in France in the Hundred Years' War. It's just that, it, uh, you know, just, just people fight back and forth for ages and ages without, without getting anywhere. <laughs> and you, you wonder, um, and of course in those days it was the nobility and the, and the uh, regals and whatnot that were doing all the instigating of this stuff, and, and uh, I don't know what uh, if you could say we should learn something from from that type of fighting, and, and or should we just try to do without it? But uh, uh, look at what's going on in, in Yugoslavia now, and, and uh, other uh, and <clears throat> all the things that that Wilson's tried to get established to bring peace to Europe uh, have fallen apart. Um, I mean, look at, look at Czechoslovakia, for instance. That's uh, of interest to me because I come from a, a town that's largely Czech and um, wasn't a very popular place for a German to be in 1939. <laughs> I don't know what you went through, but... Uh, and, and I, I remember, uh, well, it wasn't the same guy that uh, there's a before the war picture of, of me and, a, and a, another fellow from the bank that I worked at or walking down the street were, uh, must be carrying a lot of cash because they normally just sent one guy, but if they had a bunch of, or a bunch of valuables, whatever it might be. But anyway, um, uh, we had this other fellow that worked at the bank. Uh, he was the did the collections for the school savings plan, and um, his name was Wally Moore, M O M O H R, and his family was from Canada, and they got uh, this so picked on uh, by all their neighbors and what I don't know, all their English <laughs> or Welshmen or whatever they were that they came down to the United States, migrated to the United States and set up shop here and uh, found that it wasn't so bad being a German here as it was in Canada. <laughs> and, uh, and yet uh, there's still a certain amount of uh, German uh, background that, that uh, turns a, certain, a person a certain way in, in that uh, uh, like my my German family came to Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, and settled there, and uh, there <clears throat> I don't know too much about their politics uh, or where they fit in, but a lot of the Germans in that part of the settled in that part of the country uh, favored the um, uh, Republican Party, and not not so much on on the basis of what you might think now, but uh, it seemed odd that that they uh, attached themselves to the Republican Party because they were they were at the same time 
in other parts of the United States were very much against slavery. And um, so they, uh, and I, I'm not sure where my cousins that I'm corresponding with now trying to set up the genealogy of their branch of the family. I don't know where they fit, they fit in and I've got to watch myself if I <laughs> don't 